lecture, memorial lecture of uh, Shri late Satpal Sahani ji. We have it every year, and today is the twelfth lecture. And the theme of the lecture this year is Indo-China conflict. Well, as far as the relations between the two nations are concerned, after the Communist Party in China took over, the relations varied. In fact, it is also characterized by border dispute resulting into various war, clashes, standoffs. To include, to start with, 1962 aggression by China. Thereafter, 1967, Nathula and Chola, it was also a some, somewhat a warlike where all sorts of weapons were used and we suffered 88 casualties, whereas China suffered 340 casualties. 1986-87, Samdru Cho, that is Samdurang Cho Valley, there was again a standoff for a long time. And 2017, Doklag standoff, and the latest was Galwan Valley in 2020, which we all are aware, where we lost 20 soldiers, including one commanding officer, and Chinese lost 40 soldiers. Even today, the situation all along the line of actual control is not very peaceful. You all must have heard and read also what the chief of army staff on 12th of January, while briefing the media, he said that the threat level has not reduced despite disengagement of troops at multiple friction points. But this is at the background. Gentlemen, we have two very eminent scholars, eminent personalities with us. That is Maruf Razaji and Major General Gigi Davedi. Both are very expert and have a vast knowledge on the subject. Maruf Raza, he is a soldier, a writer, a journalist, a defense analyst anchor and commentator, and also an academician. Perfect is all in one. After his education, he joined the army. He was fascinated by his father, Brigadier Raza, who was serving, served in the regiment of Grenadiers. And Maruf also got the same regiment in 1980, but he served for a short while in 1993. He resigned from the army service, but as long as he was there, he did very well. He was also instructor in Indian Military Academy. Maruf Raza is a mentor of Security Watch India. He is also has built up impeccable reputation of being the best defense analyst. I extend my warm welcome to Maruf Razaji. Thank you, sir. Major General Gigi Davedi is also a soldier, an author who has written many books. He is a journalist. He is an academician, he is corporate trainer and a social worker. After his school education from Sanic School, Amravati Nagar, he joined National Defense Academy in 1968. And thereafter, he got commissioned from Indian Military Academy in 1971. 
I must say that I feel lucky to have been associated with him from the IMA. We were in the same company and the coast mate. What I want to say, uh, as far as the Vedi is concerned, he is a wonderful human being. Just two weeks back, when I rang up and requested him that we are organizing an event, would you be kind enough to spare some time and give you a valuable uh, views on the subject? And he very kindly agreed. So it's my grateful thanks to the, the Vedi. Thank you, Karan. Thank time. you. Thank you. Well, General Devedi is a war veteran of Bangladesh war. He later commanded his 16 yacht in Saichin, commanded a brigade in Kashmir Valley, commanded mountain division in the Northeast. More importantly, he was defense attache in China for more than two and a half years, from 97 to 99. He retired from the army in 2009 after 38 years of distinguished service. A word, word about academic career, in his academic career, General Devedi achieved distinction and recognition both at national and international levels. I welcome you, sir, to Thank this. You, Thank you. I also now welcome Shirimati Prem Sahani ji, Mohit Sahani, Navneet Sahani, and their daughter, and all the, of the family who have joined this important event today evening. I also welcome Dr. Ashok Bahanji, who is a patron of IIPA JK Regional Branch, under whose patronage this organization is doing extremely well. I also welcome Shri B.R. Sharmaji, the chairman, who is also a guide and supportive all the time. I also welcome Shri K.B. Jandial Ji, Shri Sudarshan Kumar Ji, Vikrant Kuthiala Ji, Professor Alka Sharma Ji, Dr. Anil Gupta Ji, A.M. Batali Sahab. In fact, I would Welcome all the members of the IIPA from Jammu, Kashmir, and Ladakh. I also welcome our defense veterans, Brigadier Ramanji, Colonel Varendar Sahi, Veer Chakra of 1971, Colonel Shiv Chaudhary, Colonel J.P. Singh, and others. Then I would once again welcome each and every one of you, whosoever is here on the WebEx. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for introducing the speakers and all other members present in today's prestigious function. And I request our patron, Dr. Ashok Bhan, sir to pay formal tribute to Sherry Satpal Sani, sir, who was the founding member of IP JNK Regional Branch. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Anil. Our guest of honor, Major General Duvedi, noted defense analyst of the country, Shri Maru Raza, who shall be delivering the 12th Satpal Sani Memorial Lecture. Shri B.R. Sharma, Chairman of the IIPA, family members of Shri Sati Sani, Madam Sati Sani, Navneet, Malti, and Mohit, 
श्री जंडयाल करुण करण सिंह प्रोफेसर अलका अनिल फ्रेटर्निटी अवर गेस्ट लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन वी हैव टुडे अमंगस्ट अस ए वेरी फॉर्मिडेबल ड्यूओ टू स्पीक ऑन ए सब्जेक्ट ऑन विच आईज ऑफ अवर एंटायर security and strategic community are focused formidable because mr maruf raza's academic brilliance is complemented by the practical wisdom that general divedi possesses general divedi has deep understanding of indo china relations by virtue of is commanding a battalion in siachen and a division in the northeast as also serving as a defense attache in beijing besides authoring a book on the 1962 war shri maruf raza is a former soldier author and i would say one of our finest strategic thinkers and defense analyst he is much sought after on tv debates and you all are familiar with his no nonsense approach the deep knowledge and analytical skills i am very glad that two of you have decided to join us today we look forward to your addressing us Ladies and gentlemen, Sri Satpal Sani would have keenly followed the proceedings on a subject like this. I say this because in his long career as a journalist and PR man who donned top positions of the Information Department of the erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir, Sri Sani saw action. from close quarters as a war correspondent beginning with the indo pak war of 1947-48 with close repo with the top political as well as military leadership satishani was much sought after by a wide array of national and international newspapers and agencies to cover the post partition events and indo pak wars in jammu and kashmir satpal sani was a veteran journalist and a valued friend and colleague his interview to andrew whitehead of bbc on 27th march 2005 in jammu tells volumes about his commitment to journalism this interview is an insider's description of the happenings no, no, of the winter of 1947 and difficulties one encountered in a war okay. situation with rather primitive communication channels available to transmit the dispatches let me quote how satishani describes the day before indian army landed at srinagar airport and i quote satishani to andrew white so i knew what was going on and i was very curious to know a little more i used to go up and down srinagar from the cantonment area to national conference headquarters which was shifted to palladium chowk so we picked up that troops would be landing tomorrow morning so next morning on 27th october we kept on looking at the skies and ultimately around about 8 o'clock or so we heard the roar of a plane and there was a sigh of relief all over srinagar uncourt Satiji was there in the midst of action some top journalists from national and international media had landed in Srinagar they wanted a local stringer 
to cover the events. So as early as 30th October, an offer came to him from Times of India and News Chronicle and Satisani readily accepted to work for them. In about 10 days, accreditation came from the Ministry of Defense and Satisani became a war correspondent. Well in time to join a handful of journalists who accompanied Pandit Nehru on his historic journey to Baramula a few days after, on 14th November 1947. Soon after, Baramula was liberated from the Kabbalis. He went on to work for scores of papers and agencies, including BBC, for 22 years. Reuters, New York Times, Voice of America, UPI, National Geography, London Times, etc. And later for the state government, as I said, where he rose to the rank of Director General of Information. Ladies and gentlemen, Andrew Whitehead found Satisani at the age of 83, a slightly fit and an exceptionally articulate gentleman with a very good memory, 83, age of 83. Satisani was indeed full of life and energy. He displayed this energy in his long association with the JFK regional branch of IAPA in different capacities, including the director of seminars and our editor in chief. I can vividly recall his participation, accompanied by his lovely wife, Prem Sani, in every event, always very punctual, well dressed, articulate, and willing to work in any capacity. He had a creative positivity around him, and that made him immensely productive and popular. Satisani had the ability to lead, and ladies and gentlemen, he always led from the front. I join you all in paying my humble tributes to our friend and colleague, late Sri Satpal Sani. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So without wasting any more time, it's, it's my privilege to now invite Shri Maru Raza sir, to deliver the 12th Satisani Memorial Lecture. Over to you, sir. Right. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, all the distinguished luminaries who are present here. I wish to thank you for both having given me such uh, an impressive introduction. I'm not half as good as I made out to be. And I wish to thank you for having invited me for this lecture. But I'll try and make a contribution. And the contribution would be at a time when, as was brought out by the distinguished Mr. Bhan, that everybody, at least in the establishment, is seeking answers and trying to find how to engage with China without matters spilling out of hand. Now, China's interest in India has been known to us, but for some reason, for at least the last, uh, I would say, two and a half decades or nearly three decades, there was a general belief that things had been brought under control and we were in a position of being able to engage with each other in what one author has recently called bulletless border management. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, mm -hmm. there lay the challenge of know. how to move the relationship forward, how to not let the boundary dispute remain a thorn between the two sides. The Chinese have often suggested, as distinguished 
experts here amongst you would know that we can have our relationship grow in other areas and in due course of time resolve the boundary dispute please understand ladies and gentlemen that china has boundaries or borders with 14 countries formally it has apparently resolved its disputes with 12 countries 13th there is movement to try and find a way out with Bhutan. But when India, we are at a state of what I would call a strategic plateau, that we're not going up, we're not going down, but things have come to stall where they are. China also has disputes with other countries with which it doesn't share boundaries. So there are several things that got me thinking about where is the problem. First, you know, when the Galwan incident took place, as the distinguished Colonel Saab was brought out, you know, I was pulled in by media circles to comment regularly on television. I began writing also, sometimes in Times of India, but more so in Tribune. And of course, on some of the websites that I write, like the Times of India's uh, Times Now's website called timesnownews.com. But the more I went into the problem, the more I realized I didn't know enough. And I tried to speak to some informed people. Uh, those were COVID times, so one couldn't really go out and engage with people. But the general uh, response I got from people that you know that there is a problem, but what is the problem? Where do we begin? And when you address issues in the historical context, I always believe that you have to have a start point. Otherwise, you go into infinity and you are not going to be able to find a solution because you don't know where the problems lie. So let me try and sort of quickly put you through what I believe, and as I have argued in my book, which has come out recently and seems to be quite popular, it's called Contested Lands. Jal Divedi has a copy, which I was very happy to pass on to him when I last met him at the Sunset TV studios, and I invited him to share his wisdom with us on a variety of issues. And of course, he will have his say and views on those issues. But this book of mine, Contested Land, came out of really my effort to try and understand Sino-Indian boundary dispute. And as I went into it, you know, you could go into centuries of this expedition happened and that expedition happened and this party put its flag there and that party laid the claim there. But really, there are two major issues and I would say probably two or three not so major issues, but they're connected with the major issues. So the first major issue is that the two areas which are contestable or contested by both sides are the boundary lines in Aksai Chin, between Aksai Chin and Ladakh. You would be familiar with it, most of you being from the state of JNK and now Union Territory will soon to become state again. And Aksai Chin, for those who may not be too familiar with the map, is largely, if you look at the map of India and the top of it was Jammu Kashmir, then eventually divided into Ladakh and Jammu Kashmir. Ladakh's part has a hook on the top north, northeast, going towards Tibet. That area is Aksai Chin, which, as we know, since independence and even perhaps a bit before that or around that time, 50s definitely, has been occupied by China. And China, to my mind, is unlikely to give up on Aksai Chin. Whatever the assertions of the chest-thumping nationalists in the country that wo hamari zameen hai, leke hai. Uh, I find it militarily and practically impossible. Two, the other boundary line, and so Aksai Chin is divided from Ladakh, 
by what has come to be known as the line of actual control. And the line of actual control actually only became a usable terminology from 1993 onwards. Before that, it was China's claim line and India's claim line. And one of the reasons why we had the conflict in 62 was about China pushing ahead of what we were more or less reconciling to a claim line. Reference Chow and Lai's visit to India, 5960. Reference the maps he had provided to Pandit Ji's government. But Pandit Ji was riding high those days. He was internationally a sought after personality, leader of the non aligned movement, and in many ways, really the champion of the third world. So Panditji was in no mood to accept any claims by China. There was the other line, and which is the McMahon line. The McMahon line is the one that, if you look at the map of India and its northeast, is the one which keeps Arunachal Pradesh with India, erstwhile NIFA, Northeast Frontier Agency, and at the outs on the outer periphery of Arunachal Pradesh on the north, it touches what is Tibet, China calls South Tibet. And the McMahon line really runs from the eastern side of Sikkim and goes up to the tri-junction, which is the Myanmar-China-India boundary. And so there are two disputed boundaries between India and China. And really conflicts or claims revolve around those two boundary lines. The two other issues which are connected with it are about the status of Tibet and how Tibet in itself became a motivation for the British Empire to guard the ingress of the Russian Cossack warriors and other invading forces to stop on the northwest outskirts of Tibet, general area around Xinjiang, which is north of Aksai Chen. And the British Empire wanted to define the limits of Tibet vis-a-vis -vis India. And so therefore, that conference took place which came to be known as the Shimla Conference of 1913, 1914, ended in 1914, started in 1913. And that conference, the outcome was the McMahon line, but there was no resolution on the line of actual control, what we know today. Those days, they were still to resolve what to call it. The other issue which is connected is China's geostrategic ambitions. So in Tibet also, there is a modern day Chinese geostrategic ambition. So in the British time, the effort was to define the boundaries of Tibet. And Tibet was a large independent entity. Later people said that Tibet was not recognized. But the point to note is the economists noted that a large mass of land as an independent nation if it has been untrammeled for more than 32 years, definitely qualifies to be an independent nation, whether it's recognized or not. The concept of recognition started really largely after the creation of the UN in 1945. However, Mao Zedong, when he took over power, he defined the agenda for the Communist Party and therefore, Communist China. He said, Tibet is the palm of my right hand. And the five fingers that need to be absorbed with the palm are Ladakh, Nepal, Bhutan, Sikkim, and Arunachal. So, therefore, this remains a kind of sword that hangs on the head of Chinese leaders. Mao went out to do that in 62, but subsequent leaders haven't really abandoned that Maoist line, though Deng Xiaoping, his successor, certainly abandoned the Maoist belief that power comes from the barrel of a gun. He felt you need to grow rich and prosperous 
and you become powerful automatically. So that is the baggage. So there are two boundary issues. There are two issues linked with subsidiary claims. One is the claim connected with the boundary, but the claim over Tibet. And the other is China's agenda to use Pakistan to unsettle India. And this is something that many of us have ignored, but has been in the offing from 1963, when China, Pakistan signed the Shaksgam Valley Agreement, which is north of POK, and that laid the grounds for a lot of Chinese investments in POK, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, was a more recent phenomena, but Chinese built dams there, and the dams are linked with China's agenda to store water in the areas of the POK from the Indus and its tributaries. Water, not just for making power. I don't think Pakistan has the resources to pay for that water and the energy that comes from it. But China intends to store the water and has started doing it by making storage as a route to making silicon wafers. Because every 10,000 liters of still water meshed with sands, like the sand of the Taklamakan Desert north of Ladakh, and with some electronic activity, can lead to creating 30 centimeters square of silicon wafer. And as all of us know, silicon wafers allow you to make chips. Chips control everything from phones to satellites. So that is the larger Chinese agenda. Now, where do the contentious claims lie? The first thing to understand is that in Aksai Chin, ever since the Treaty of Chushul of 1842, and thereafter the appointment of the Maharaja of Kashmir in 1846 after the Treaty of Amritsar, Kashmir's boundaries began to expand. And there was an Anglo-Indian surveyor who the Maharaja of Kashmir took kindly to and suggested to him to try and show Kashmir's boundaries as far northeast as possible. So that hook you see on the map, northeast of Ladakh, led him, his name was Mr. Johnson, and led him to define the boundary that far. Since they were far-flung areas, from Ladakh, uh, from Tibet's boundaries, and there wasn't that much activity and interest of Lasha in it, people kind of let it be. The British were not too happy with that line, which came to be known as the Johnson Line, because they felt the Maharaja overstepped his turf. Then came after, this was around 1865, then came the Johnson Ardagh Line. And the Johnson Ardagh Line was the line that ran along the little inside of the Johnson line, westwards towards Leh Ladakh, along the Kundun Mountains. And that line came into being around 18, I think it was around 1897. And just after that, British efforts to try and limit Russian intrusions via Kashgar into Ladakh led to the McCartney line also. So there were three lines that were essentially doing the rounds about the outer northeastern periphery of JNK. At some stage between 1912 and thereafter, the British began to promote the johnson Ardagh line as an acceptable boundary. So not as far away as Johnson said, but a little closer around the Blue Mountains. And there was an atlas of China between 1917 and 1939 that kind of accepted this. But when Mao Zedong came, he dismissed all earlier arrangements and all earlier treaties and basically said that what I occupy is mine. That led to claims by China based on their occupation of Aksai Chin, which was under Chinese control well before it came in the public domain. It came in the public domain around 1957. 
And there was an expedition by a captain later, Major General Rajendranath, which went and found Chinese there, but his expedition report is still secret. Panditji was reluctant to go public with it, but it somehow became public because of various journalists and their uh, exposés. So this became a matter of debate. Uh, Panditji all along felt he could still get the new Chinese regime of Mao to become friendly with India. And one of those was the Panditji Agreement, which has a longish title, but it recognizes Tibet as a region of India. A uh, region of China, I'm sorry. But well before that, I'm talking now, we've gone into the 50s. But there was another arrangement that I mentioned to you, the Shimla arrangement that took place in 1913-14. And when it was not coming to a suitable conclusion, as the person who had organized the initiative was then the Foreign Secretary of British India, his name was Lieutenant Colonel McMahon. And he had been involved in the definition of the Turan line which separates Pakistan from Afghanistan. So Mr. McMahon, without letting his conference completely collapse, he pulled out a map, a quarter inch map, which Jan Sahib will understand, Karl Sahib will understand. These are maps with very small indicative blocks of areas. And on that, with a thick felt pen, he drew based on more or less some survey reports that came to him from the Himalayas that these would be the ridge line that would define India's boundary in the northeast with Tibet. That became the McMahon line. And Panditji later went on record to say, as far as I'm concerned, this boundary is settled. The matter is only to resolve with the Chinese over the boundary of Ladakh in Tibet. Mao Zedong, of course, didn't take kindly to it also didn't take kindly to the fact that Panditji had been rising enormously in global stature and nobody was until then taking China that seriously. So he began to engage with Khrushchev in Russia. And one of the deals that he was striking with Khrushchev was to get the know-how to make nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapon technology was eventually given by Russia to China after Khrushchev held him in kind of house arrest in Moscow on the only first visit Mao had ever made abroad. And then finally parted with it with various concessions to Russia because Russia had been using the areas from Aksai Chin to Xinjiang well before independent China came into being the current generally known. And they had been using the Aksai Chin area and Xinjiang area for excavating uranium and other resources for Russia's nuclear program which was in the general area north of JFK, northwest of JFK, Kazakhstan. And that was a place called Semi Palatinsk, where Russia did its first nuclear test. And thereafter, Russia had joined the elite club that America was already in. Now, Mao wanted to get into that. So the know how and arrangements were given. And therefore, the Chinese nuclear program also came close to Aksai Jin, but more towards Lhasa side, slightly beyond the Himalayas from the Indian side, place called Lok Nor. So Mao therefore felt that this was the time for him to either offer India a fate comply situation or teach Nehru a lesson. So therefore, First, Chao Enlai came with messaging in 5960 and gave out a claim line. This has been given in my book with a map. And he was politely dismissed by Panditji. Then, our recognition of Tibet as a part of China, as part of the Panchil Agreement. So, China saw that India was very happy to kneel in front of the Chinese. And the tipping point for China was there were some reconnaissance flights by IAF Squadron 106. This was flown by a gentleman who was earlier squadron leader, later became wing commander, twice awarded the Mahavir Chakra. He's still alive in Mumbai. I've spoken to him. His name is Jagginath, MBCN Bar. So he took one flight over Aksai Chin and then went towards Lasha side, brought in and did multiple flights. 
and he found the Chinese presence was there, but they were no, no position to rebuff even a low flying aerial reconnaissance flight. There were just troops on the ground. When he gave his report, he was taken by a chief to meet Krishna Menon. Krishna Menon dismissed him with one sentence to say, did you see Chinese? He says, yes, sir. He said, okay, go away. He said, I did more than 100 reconnaissance flights and this is the response of the Raksha Mantri. So in a way, Krishna Menon was of the view that he would talk China out of any aggressive intent. And Nehru was heavily, heavily dependent on his IB chief, Bholanath Malik, who later admitted in his writings that he orchestrated the Longju incident of 1959, which kind of ratcheted up tensions further. And there was also reports, and I've quoted those reports in my book, of information from Panditji's secretariat going to the Americans regularly between 1949 and 62. Who was doing it? That needs to be investigated, but the indications are clear who were the people behind it. A kind of messaging that was happening was to convey to the Americans that Panditji was riding his own horse. Because Eisenhower had offered to India a kind of a military alliance. But it was dismissed because Pandit Nehru saw that like Mahatma Gandhi had non-cooperation as his calling card, Panditji's calling card would be non-alignment. And therefore, neither Russia nor America nor anybody was brought into play. And when China actually attacked India, you know, often we've read about the buffoonery that people like Lieutenant General Beji called did on the FIFA front. But there were good tough commanders on the Ladakh side, Lieutenant General Dalit Singh, General Bikram Singh, our troops held forth there. The conflict happened. It was Nehru's defeat, but the baggage was hung around everybody's neck to say it was India's defeat. The Indian army was not allowed to fight. I have often asked this question, that if an army that could do so well in World War I and II, that could do so well in 47, 48, and Kashmir, as we know, regardless of the good work of some outstanding individuals, Kashmir really is part of India today, thanks to the Indian Army. And this same army was given the ring in 62 because it was not equal, not provided with arms ammunition, not provided with the necessary military directions. Those generals that stood up to Panditji's direction, one of them was General Umrao Singh, who was commanding in the Northeast, the Corps. He was shifted to 33 Corps in Siriguri, and a new Corps was created for Biji Kaul. Biji Kaul was an ASC officer. He did not have understanding of commanding troops on the ground. He made a right royal mess of his operations. I've given the details in a chapter. And let's not blame the politicians. India's generals also let down the country. General Thapar as the army chief, General Bohi Sen as Eastern Army commander, General Monty Pallet as DMO, then brigadier. And there were many others, even General Bhullar. They were all going along with the line of Krishna Menon that don't upset the Chinese. And when the Chinese were rolling down, towards the plains of Assam, having come to Tawang, which they got without a fight, even though Tawang was prepared to put up a good big fight. There were confusing orders, conflicting orders that were passed, troops were asked to withdraw, then troops were asked to withhold. Eventually, the debate went on, should we use the Air Force? We could have, it could have altered the play, because India's Air Force would be flying better jets than the China, though Chinese in numbers had a bigger Air Force. But the main frontline aircrafts are deployed towards Taiwan because that's where they felt the Americans could be threatening them from. Our jets were flying from the planes. They could fly with full payload, full fuel load. Chinese jets would have to fly with half fuel, half payload because of high altitude of Tibet. And this nonsense that was weaved by Bolanath Malik and others that China could bomb even up to Chennai was swallowed by Panditji 
and his key circle of Krishna men and Samadhas. So therefore, we refrain from using it. So the long and short of it is that 62 was a loss because of the leadership in Delhi, both political and military. 62, I do not regard it as a defeat for the Indian army because like I say about the British, they lost many a battle, but they won the war. We had lost the battle of Nifa, but we could have won the war of 62 had it continued. It lasted for one month because Khrushchev gave that one month window to now, 19th October to 19th November, do what you want. Because Khrushchev was at that time going in for a standoff with America over the Cuban Missile Crisis. So the world's attention was there. One of the reasons why Xi Jinping encouraged his troops to intervene, and let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, nothing happens in China without the consent of the higher command. Read Ambassador uh, Gokhale's book called the, the Long Game, How China Negotiates. And he's explained that China's leadership is an octopus with a big head, and it has arms. And the arms are the military, the intelligence agencies, the finance agencies, etc., and all report to the head in Beijing, which at this point of time is Xi Jinping. At that time was Mao. And it is they who call the shots about how China would unfold its operation. And right now, when there was the effort by Chinese to intervene again, they saw a global crisis. They saw the democracies of the world floundering. There was no clear leadership on the World Forum because of the pandemic. They saw an opportunity to do what they wanted to do, but they couldn't do because this time the Indian Army has learned its lessons since 62. And though the Henderson Brooks report remains officially confidential, but I have met many officers who read it in military operations and other places, and lessons have been drawn. The Henderson Brooks report was essentially a report on the military reverses based in NIFA. Troops that fought the 1962 conflict were less than the troops that fought in the Kargil conflict. So, do you call Kargil a war? I still call it a conflict. Why? Because we didn't use all our national resources. 62 was even worse. Only one army division plus was involved in NIFA, and one division minus was involved in Nata. And military men will understand what is the plus minus, which basically means one extra brigade and one less brigade. Three brigades make a division. So, when 1967 happened, that the Chinese tried the same trick with microphones and others to threaten the Indian troops at Nathula, there was a bold commander there, General Sagat Singh, who later was the first general officer to reach Dhaka and who was also the commander of the Independent Para Brigade when it went into Goa. So, Sagat Singh was a man born for war. And Sagat Singh, after a point, briefed his superior commanders. Coincidentally, his army commander then was Sam Manikshaw, and his corps commander then was Rajit Singh Arora. Later, when he was commanding a corps in the Northeast in 71, Jajit Singh Arora general was his army commander and General Manik Shaw was in the army. So he had an equation with them. He told them beyond a point, he says, sir, I am going to draw a boundary there with Bob Wyatt. And if they tamper with it, I'm not going to suffer any consequences. He was putting it up. There was heated exchanges. And suddenly the Chinese opened fire. Sagat Singh moved up closer to the spot of action with his brigade commander, who was Brigadier MMS Batra, Mavi Chakra from uh, 65 war. And he said, just let them have it. As has been brought out, more than 340 Chinese bodies were found dead. Chinese admitted to 65 dead, which is also something they normally don't admit to any dead. We also had casualties, but we gave them such a bloody nose that they went quiet for 20 years after that. Then in 86, 87, they tried intrusions again at the spot around McMahon line where they had intruded earlier and fought the 62 conflict in the initial stages around Namkachu. 
and Sundarongchu and Namkachu and all those areas, as Jan Sahib would know, they are quite close to each other. There, there was again a swift thinking army chief, Jan Sundarji. He moved quick, troops quickly by heli lift and others and put a brigade plus around the Chinese intrusions and surrounded them. When the matter came to Rajiv Gandhi's notice around DB Day function, around 4th of January uh, in 87, he quickly called for a meeting in the ops room. And General Sundarji has told me this, that the briefing took place. The Prime Minister asked him, the General, what have you done? He says, sir, I have done what I am mandated to do, do as Army Chief, that don't let the Chinese cross any of the agreed boundary lines. He says, then what are we to do now? He says, sir, it's now your job to take a decision as Prime Minister, where do you want to go from here? What about withdrawal? Sundarji refused. He says, sorry, sir, in that case, you have to find another source of military advice. Those who suspect what I'm saying and think I'm glamorizing Sundarji, and Sundarji had his faults. He got, botched up Golden Temple operations in 84, no doubt. He botched up the intervention in Sri Lanka, no doubt. But on this one, he got it right, just like he got brass tacks. People might disagree. Look on the internet, right? Sundarji, Sundarangchu. You will get what happened. And everyone was holding their breath. You, you don't have army chiefs standing up to prime ministers. And Sundarji was quite happy to resign and walk out. Had our generals done that in 62 also, we would have not suffered the humiliation of that defeat. Anyway, lucky for the Prime Minister, lucky for the government, the Chinese felt uneasy and they decided to withdraw. Thereafter, Mr. Gandhi was invited by the Chinese for a visit to Beijing. The red carpet was rolled out because suddenly China realized that India could stand up for itself and not pussyfoot around as Pandit Nehru had done. What emerged in those meetings between Vajpayee Ji, uh, Rajiv Ji, Vajpayee Ji, and in between Narsimha Rao's widget was an agreement to more or less accept the boundary, what came to be known as the LAC in Aksai Chin and McMahon line was already there and what the China government was willing to concede, they would not unsettle settled areas. It is our shortcoming as a nation that having got another set of opportunities then after 59-60, then between 88 and 93, we failed to live up to the expectations of the Chinese to move anything forward. And if you think you are going to get a win-win situation with them in every arrangement, why they will happily back off, get real. China is a power of consequence in the world and they also have to show face to their people. And their leadership is not going to back off without having got what somebody said that China wants in Ladakh, Aksai Chin and LAC Plus. And what we want is LAC and plus, that means going to Aksai Chin. Aksai Chin is not going to come to us because China has run a very important highway there, which they built in the 50s, called Highway G219, which runs from Kashgar in Xinjiang or Xinjiang, right up to Dasha in Tibet. And it's a major communication line. One of the reasons for their intrusions recently during Galwan was to try and give more depth to that area so that the further they keep the Indian artillery from the highway, the less chances of disruption of the highway is traffic for China. Also, please remember, that was one of the reasons that the Pakistanis did the Kargil intrusions. They did the intrusions because they wanted to disrupt road traffic from Leh, Ladakh, via Kargil into Srinagar, which is the national highway. And how would they do it? By coming on to the hilltops around Kargil, and targeting us with at will and disrupting traffic and therefore disrupting supply lines to Siachen. It brings me to two issues. Siachen. What is the relevance of Siachen with China, Pakistan 
and where does India come in? You see, if you look at the map, there is the area of POK and there is the area of Aksai Chin. In between runs the wedge called Siachin, which is essentially the glacier, 76 kilometer long. And we have occupied the heights on the west of the glacier towards POK side. So Pakistan's efforts to get to the glacier have never materialized. And when Pakistanis say they are at the glacier and their reporters report from the glacier, they are standing at some other glacier, which is about 10 kilometers as the crow flies from Soltoro Ridge where our troops are. And Pakistan is not willing to accept a settlement there if it is made public. And the army chief recently indicated the actual ground position line must be held and accepted. And once it's accepted, then we can letterize and get it signed on the map. But it's not us or the Pakistanis who are in dispute about the actual ground position line. Our bureaucracy, and I have had, I won't take name, I've had defense secretaries on my TV show to say we should not rub Pakistan's nose in the snow. And Pakistan army has told two defense secretaries, at least I know. Because they've lied to their people. They've lied to the people on Siachin Me Bethe, Se, when they never got there. And we've been holding on to that thanks to our brave soldiers on the Siachin front from 1984-87. General Divedi will bear me out. I've been to the Siachin glacier, I've made films on it. I've written a confidential paper for the MOD on it. So I know the background of the problem. The long and short of it is the Siachin glacier is the wedge that keeps the Chinese towards the Karakoram side away from it and marrying up with the Pakistanis on the POK side and they have to follow a very long convoluted route of 1800 kilometers to get to POK. They want that area to merge both for extending Pakistan-China economic corridor effectively from Kashgar right up to there and linking up Aksai chain etc. Because Aksai chain is a resource base. The waters of the rivers that come out of the Aksai chain plateau could alter China standing in the world with the microchips they get. And finally, if they get Aksai Jin uh, to marry up with POK, they did a deal with Pakistan for the Shakskam Valley in 1963. And the Shakskam Valley is important because it has 242 glaciers. And therefore, if China starts uh, drawing water from those glaciers, they can make any number of microchips and maybe create Another company as powerful as China, TC, which makes 80% of the world's chips. And if they are over the Siachen Glacier, they will threaten the hell out of our positions in Leh Ladakh. Ladakh will become very vulnerable. So at the cost of freezing to death, the Indian Army has been holding on to the Siachen Glacier for at least 37 years. And finally, in the last point, the China has used Pakistan as its front to keep India unsettled. There were people in India, especially a diplomat and a right-leaning liberals and all saying, oh, oh, we must not upset the Chinese. They are not upsetting us. We are doing trade with them. Do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, every year we give to China as much money in trade. They have a two-third advantage with us on trade. As China put in to Pakistan with a promise for once in 10 years, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor of $54 billion, not about 64, 68. But for that once in a 10 year promise, Pakistan's crawling in front of China. On a lighter side, maybe if we gave that money one time to Pakistan, Pakistan would bow down in front of us also. And it's a suggestion I have made to people in Delhi. It's a suggestion I made to some US academics, including Stephen Cohen, but I said, instead of spending that time, 10 years ago, $600 billion in Afghanistan and losing thousands of troops, had you given one-tenth the money to Pakistan's army, they would have fought for you in Afghanistan. But for the Western world, war is business also. And China has therefore created Pakistan's nuclear program, which I call China's nuclear program in Pakistan. And there is enough written about it. There is enough evidence including admissions by A.Q. Khan when in moments of frustration with house arrest. So that's where the strategic equation lies. Should we have another conflict with China? There are three elements to it. One, if there is a territorial push by China, 
I have written one or two cover stories in the magazine Open. You can check it out on the net. Type Maru Fraza Open China. You will get some stories. If there is a land conflict, China will not be able to make any serious gains. We can hold. They might move in troops swiftly. They might have little better equipment than us, but we are pretty much okay to hold on to China and hold on to a Pakistani threat. So the bottom line is, if China attacks us, Pakistan will. But if Pakistan attacks us, China might not. The second point is, is China going for a conventional conflict or will China go in for a strategic effort to cripple us? That means cyber attacks, unrestricted warfare, biological warfare, some of it we have witnessed through the pandemic. Then I dare say, ladies and gentlemen, we are not too well prepared. And if the next conflict is not going to be fought on land, but in space, then China again has the advantage. But going back to the old Western theory of mutually assured destruction, my belief is we have to alter our thinking and our doctrine, which, which means that don't wait for China to keep making the first move and you react to it. The classic example is if they attack you, then you withhold your strike cores and strike divisions and think, Ab wo kahan kahega, tab usko surprise dunga. A simple logic is use the revolving door strategy. They attack you in one place, you attack them in another two places. And then stand there and tell them, I will give back what is yours if you give back what is mine and let us have a full and final agreement. But the bottom line is, China will not allow India to grow and succeed in Asia because it sees India as its only rival. And the chances for India to avert Chinese aggression are to seal a formal arrangement with the US and the squad and on the fluff we hear with the quad is only Angrezi. The reality is you get a deal with them because we are the only quad member that has a border with China. Nobody else has. They're floating around in the high seas and trying to sell vaccines to each other. We have to get an arrangement in place that if our territorial sovereignty is threatened, we will request and require you to intervene. If not, thank you very much, Washington. We are going back into an alliance with the Russians. I know it is going to affect the agenda of a lot of bureaucrats and diplomats whose children study in American universities on scholarships. But let's get real. Is India more important or your children's future? Ask yourself the question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for a very detailed historical perspective on the theme for today's lecture. Right. It, it, it became quite evident that you yourself are an encyclopedia on this subject. The way you were able to recollect the exact dates, the exact names, the exact context and beautifully narrate the entire uh, context that taking us into the history and bringing us to the present. So now uh, it's, it's my privilege to now uh, invite Major General Dr. Gigi Devedi, sir, who, as Dr. Bhan said, that is a practitioner who has served in that particular area, may now re request him for his presidential remarks on this subject. Over to you, sir. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah, thank you. I Am I audible and is my audio okay? Yes, sir. You are audible, but I can't see you. But anyhow, you you are you are audible. I don't know how about others. Can you see? Uh, okay, fine. Please go ahead, sir. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, firstly, I think uh, I need to thank uh, the Institute of Public Administration the team and then particular my good old friend Karan who got over to me and uh, when a course made request uh, that is not a request it's an order and that's what is the course made camaraderie all about and uh, more than that uh, it's also a privilege always to share the stage uh, with the uh, friend Maruf on number of occasions and uh, we have a mutual respect for each other, both as soldiers and also as professionals. And this is a very uh, important uh, occasion for me to uh, preside over and uh, share uh, some of my insights 
because I have a little advantage uh, having served in all these areas like Pagongso, Chishul, Siachen, commanding a division, and then uh, seen uh, China very closely for three years as a defense attaché. And I've written about more than 40 articles and also uh, a very a book uh, which was uh, co authored by us uh, as part of the USA team. And uh, I was able to bring in uh, the Chinese perspective because uh, we all know why we lost the war, but very little was done as to how Chinese won the war. So, in this book, we brought out how detailed planning the Chinese did uh, to give us. A, I mean, a defeat which was very embarrassing for a nation of our size, magnitude, and our credentials. Well, I'll take five minutes to just wrap up what Maroof has uh, beautifully put across and take about 20 minutes uh, to bring out some of the things uh, which are deeper as to why we go wrong when we look at China and why we get uh, surprised and not only us, the world over. Now that requires a little more deeper introspection and that will give us why we should not go wrong in future. Because basically not many people understand China because it is not so easy to decode the mind of Chinese leaders. Now, firstly, a very brief snapshot and to wrap up what uh, Maruf has uh, very beautifully put out. Well, he gave a very deeper background and especially why the territorial dispute actually manifested the way it is. And uh, the famous line, the Johnson line in 1865, McCartney line of 1895, and then of course came the Chinese line of 1960. And how the situation got panned out and how it went uh, from a confrontation to a conflict and then ultimately into defeat. He also highlighted the strategic importance of uh, Tibet. And uh, more than that, I'll bring out in my you know, brief uh, address as to what Tibet actually means to China. Then, of course, uh, uh, our follies, what Maru Valetti brought out, that Nehru, our you know, approach, which are more non-alignment, more peaceful, and uh, we went into conflict not at all well prepared, not at all prepared, rather. Rather, we got surprised. There was a general you know, appreciation from, from IB and people like you know, Malik, that Chinese will never attack. But then Chinese have always done something which no one expected. If I take you to 1953, 1950-53 Korean War, MacArthur was on the Yalu. And uh, Americans were to have Christmas at home, the troops, but then half a million Chinese crossed Yalu and pushed them back onto 38th parallel. Now that sort of lessons we actually ignored, had we studied the uh, Korean War well, and I wrote a book on that, and I was instantly also defense attaché to North Korea, uh, we would have not gone wrong the way we did in 1962. And then Maruf also brought out uh, very vividly uh, this importance of Siachen. I incidentally commanded 16 Jat on the Northern Glacier for nine months and uh, sat on the Saltoro, and uh, we gave a pretty tough time to the other side. And uh, we also created a record. They say that Siachen is very difficult to hold in terms of casualties. 16 Jard had two, only two casualties. That record still stands even today. I commanded the battalion in 1991. Then Baruf also gave out the Park China collusion the threat that can emanate, and uh, what kind of uh, warfare that can uh, manifest in time to come. It may not be only ground related. I'll give a little bit of brief on the Chinese zone warfare, 
what we have to prepare and i have done extensive work on this and i like to share my own insight and uh, i think maruf very uh, aptly gave a round up that we need to take china very seriously and we have to have a very long term policy right now we are just uh, playing ball by ball we are on more on reactive mode we don't have a very deep thinking policy and uh, we also need to see as to how we can take on china not only ourselves but with the larger partnerships with the you know alliances like, like quad how the center of gravity will shift more on to the indo pacific indian ocean i think these are the things which we need to look at the future now i'll take about uh, 15 to 20 minutes just to give uh, some deeper perception on why we go wrong when we look at china and uh, how we should not go wrong when we look at the future especially next uh, 20 to 30 years so i'll start with a very famous quotation uh, of uh, president john of kennedy and uh, he had uh, made this quotation when he was the president and uh, what he said was that geography has made us neighbors history has made us friends oblique enemies economics has made us partners and necessity has made us allies so we got to look at as to why the chinese were so concerned about tibet and uh, why we could not actually catch them up early when they were doing lot of activities if you go into the chinese culture chinese have a great uh, penchant and obsession with the conducive periphery because in chinese history whenever the center was strong and the periphery was uh, submissive or subjugated chinese made a great progress and when he, when the chinese center was weak and the periphery was out of control there was always chaos what chinese call luan so therefore when mao zedong came into power in 1949 and his famous quote that power flows through the barrel of the gun he straight away started to mark the boundaries of china and therefore in 1950 pla walked into tibet same time they occupied east turkestan that is xinjiang and also got hold of mongolia incidentally you know the great wall of china runs south of inner mongolia chinese are annexed in the mongolia so first thing what mao did was to secure chinese periphery and three outlying provinces of xinjiang tibet and mongolia now tibet you know in 1914 after the the macmohan line at shimla agreement had declared itself independent because the chinese center had gone weak and therefore there was a chaos all around and that led to the civil war so what happened was that mao knew the importance of tibet what partly maru brought out but tibet is also the water tank of the world five major river system brahmaputra mekong you know salween all these emanate from tibet and 1000 square kilometer of glaciers are in tibet and china is a starved of water north china where the population is about 65 percent only 14 percent water is available so that's why the tibet is actually very important beside the mineral resources very important for the water point of view and that is what was one of the reasons secondly he wanted to link up xinjiang with tibet because xinjiang even today is very restive and therefore they have to make this road 
from Kashgar to Lhasa. And that road had to pass through Exechen. So it was a compulsion, strategic compulsion, that they had to grab Exechen to make this road. And that was the actually the lifeline. And that where the conflict actually started. Second is the Chinese always believe that mandate comes to heaven. And in Chinese dynasties, there have been no bloodlines, means father passing the baton to the son. And that has continued even today. The Communist Party of China is 100 years old. Last year, they celebrated the centenary. But there's no blood connection between Mao Zedong, Tang Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, and Xi Jinping. They have no blood relation. In Chinese system, the best person is made the leader. And if today, in 1949, China was a step behind us. In 1990, China and India were at par. Our, uh, you know, GDP, China had 390 billion, our 360 billion. We are almost at par. But today, China is five times ahead of us. It's not only the communist system. It's also to do the leadership. And they pick up. They have a system very different. But they try and pick up the best guy. And it's not Mao Zedong's son or daughter. No, that doesn't run in this system. So that is one of the things we must understand. That in this system, they try to put the best guy, regardless of the bloodlines. China has always been expansionist. It is nothing new. They always sought tributes. And therefore, if we thought that we are going to deal with China, uh, you know, respecting the borders, it was a great folly. And Chinese believe in a concept of comprehensive national power. Means to total power, to military power, the political, economic, and that is what they work upon. And ironically, why Chinese don't take us seriously? Because the power differential between us and China is about one is to five. And Chinese <laughs> make it very clear that India, China cannot be hyphenated. This always say that we will not deal with your equals, whereas India tries to do that. Now that is one of the areas. So if you look at these Chinese five, six cultural points, that periphery, their obsession, expansionism, and the one is surprise and deception. You know, that is the Chinese uh, written in stone. And they have always uh, held their cards very close. In 62, no one expected, our leadership didn't expect the Chinese will attack. And same thing happened in 2020. And as I said, I commanded my battalion in Chishul also, done enough full soldiering in Kalash range. And Chinese surprised us. In May, early May, they came in. We are caught off guard. Absolutely. And uh, obviously, in mountains, it is the first mover advantage. Like we are holding Siachen, and Musharraf tried. In 1987, with his special services brigade to get hold of the pass, the Bela Fondla pass, he lost uh, 300 fatal and 400 casualties, and he almost sacked, but he survived, then later to become the president of the country. Now, therefore, whenever we look at China, please understand Chinese believe in use of power, Chinese believe in expansionism. Chinese believe in superiority, and uh, Tibet is actually the dispute. Chinese are not going to accept any settlement until Dalai Lama fades away, and until Tibet is sorted out, because they feel that we are actually encouraging the Tibet problem by having Dalai Lama here, and that's a very sore point with them. So anyone who feels that we are going to sort out the border problem. When I was there in 2000, our negotiation, JWG, was upbeat that we are going to sort out this issue. And let me tell you, two decades later, we have not moved an inch. So therefore, until Tibet is sorted out, 
the border problem is not going to be sorted out. And as far as Ladakh is concerned, because of the strategic importance of Xinjiang Kashgar Highway, and now the POK, they have invested so much in POK, and they have almost uh, come on from the Karakoram side to threaten even this Asian. They are not going to negotiate an inch as far as the LAC or the boundary in Ladakh is concerned. We can keep talking. Chinese talked uh, with the Americans in Panmin Jom in Korean for two years and they did not yield an inch. And exactly, only thing we are going to gain is our army is going to get more adept in negotiation, that is military diplomacy, but nothing won't come out of it. Now, second issue is the Chinese national objective. We got to exploit the Chinese vulnerability. We are not doing that. And sorry to say, I have done the diplomatic hat for three years. Our diplomacy, diplomacy appeasement. Our diplomats, they behave like, I think, uh, pit squeaks when they are in China. When they come here, they write lovely books. They also share a forum at Harvard Kennedy School. I am an alumni of Harvard Kennedy School. They get a good, uh, you know, forums to speak, but that is all after all afterthought wisdom. But when they are there, I, I less talk the better, but appeasement is a diplomacy. Chinese have four important national objectives. Stability. They are very concerned about Communist Party losing power. If Communist Party loses power, the Chinese DNA will change. So any threat to Communist Party cannot be accepted. And our uh, supporting Dalai Lama is also taken as part of instability because they feel that we are making China unstable. Sovereignty. You know, Chinese uh, Communist Party took a vow that we will never let China face humiliation again. That is the century of humiliation from 1841, the first opium war, till 1949. And they say, we will make China rich and prosper, but do not question the political system. So sovereignty means reclaiming all the lands that they lost during the century of humiliation uh, due to the unequal treaty. And uh, that includes South China Sea, that includes Taiwan. And let's not take it uh, lightly. It now includes Arunachal Pradesh. They are serious about it. But we are only thinking, oh, no, no, they are only making noises. Well, they are, they are at it. And they will only relinquish the claim, provided there is some settlement in Tibet. Otherwise, they are going to press this claim. And uh, when I come to my last uh, point of how they are going to do it, I will dwell upon a little more. Third is economy. The Chinese Communist Party is in power only on economy. In case Chinese economy derails, the Chinese Communist Party will lose power. So therefore, for China, economy is very important. And as Maruf was you know, bringing out, the Chinese want uh, the border problem to be on the back burner. And you know, we had the problem for last 20 months. But what about the economy? Our two-way trade has hit $120 billion. And our deficit has grown from 60 to $80 billion. So Chinese are having ball. They are keeping us engaged on the border. And they are having a very favorable trade balance. And let me again give you a statistics. As far as the trade is concerned, $120 billion is just 3% of Chinese trade. But when you look at the $80 billion deficit, 10% means the Chinese favorable balance of payment comes 10% from India. So they are had the way while they have kept the border very engaged and hot, but they have had the economy going. And if we can hit the Chinese economy or if the world can hit Chinese economy, Xi Jinping may not be there for very long. But as long as Chinese economy is doing well, I think Xi Jinping is going to be there 
for more than decade or even beyond. And lastly is the emergence of global power. Well, Chinese leaders have laid it very clearly that by 2050, China is going to be the global power. And they have no doubt about it. And they are going, it, going very systematically. In fact, they are going to overtake America by 2035. And lately, I was doing my last program at Harvard Kennedy School. And the Americans are really very worried that China is going to overtake them. And they are competing with them, you know, neck to neck. They are doing a great job in space. They are done 5G. Their technology is doing exceedingly well. Economy is going to overtake. So I think India has to take China very seriously because they don't treat us as competitors. They all treat us as already not even number two or number three. So if we have to take them on, I think we have to do a couple of things which are going to now spell out. Before that, we don't understand the Chinese system. Chinese system is centrally driven. There are seven people who run China. And among seven, Xi Jinping is more equal than others. They take decision in split seconds. And then there are 25 body of 25 people, Politburo. Most of the things are decided in then and there. So in China, the decisions are taken very fast. And they are able to put the decision into execution. If they want to lock up Xi'an, uh, population 11 millions, they can do that. Or they locked up the uh, complete uh, Wuhan, they could do that. So their things happen absolutely as a military fashion. And secondly, PLA is the party of the, is the military of the party. It's not the military of the Chinese Republic. It is loyalty. It is answers to the party. So party and the PLA, they run the country. And Xi Jinping is the commander in chief, not only to take salutes at the Tiananmen Square, he actually controls all the five theater commanders as the head of the CMC. So any conflict is actually centrally approved by the highest authority. And secondly, the chain of command is very short and very swift. So any conflict with China, will be already decided at the speed of decision. Whereas our speed of decision is very tardy and very slow. The critical issues, as I say again, is Tibet, divergent nation, national interest, Sinopark nexus, which is a very worrisome and huge power differential that is there between India and China. Until this is addressed, I think our problem with China is only going to multiply. So what is the way ahead? Because that is more important. That what are we looking at when we are looking at the issues with China and the issues with conflict? As far as LAC is concerned, I have written extensively, I wrote a dozen articles I wrote in Indian Express, that status of LAC has got redefined. Status of LAC has got changed. We were initially saying that we don't know where the LAC runs. Like as a battalion commander or brigade commander or division commander, we exactly know where the LAC is. There's no doubt. Because when you go on the ground, you are never left in doubt. You exactly know where to patrol, where to defend, where to deny, where to dominate. All is known. We used to go and patrol up to the patrolling points. And they start with patrolling point 10 from Jepson Plateau and they keep increasing. Hot Spring 15, Gogra 17, and then Pegongso. All the patrolling points are marked on the ground. But Chinese have changed that. Today we are no more patrolling up to the patrolling points. At Jepson Plateau, Chinese are dominating all the patrolling points. They have gained about 900 square kilometers of area in that. Similarly, they are not allowing us to patrol up to finger eight. When I was the CEO, we used to go even beyond up to Sirija. But today, you are stuck at finger three. Means status of LAC has changed. Similar thing is between Gogra and the Hot Spring. So point I'm trying to make is that Chinese have changed the status quo. 
and 2020 in the May when Chinese came, they came with a purpose to change the LAC. As Maru brought out in 1962, Chinese totally used three divisions and we had almost two divisions to face them. This time in May 2020, Sir, I'm, I'm really sorry to interject, sir. Just a small message. Maruf Saab wants to leave, actually. He has other commitment. So I'm sorry to interject here. May I request Alka ma'am to, you know, please thank him and then we can continue, sir. Please, sir. Please unmute yourself. I am, I'm sorry, uh, Major General uh, Duvedi, sir. Uh, but uh, I would like to place on record a sincere thanks to uh, Mr. Maru Praza, sir, our keynote for the our keynote for the day. Uh, sir, it was sheer thrill to hear you. We have heard you many a times on the television in various debates, but it was indeed a worthwhile experience to hear from you in person, although online, but it was in person, the kind of understanding that you built today it was a marvelous, marvelous understanding about the Indo-China conflict. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, although we would be proposing a formal word of thanks towards the end, but uh, I thought that before you leave, let us uh, thank you for sparing your time and being with us. We know your schedule and uh, we are grateful for your, uh, for your time with us. And we will certainly be requesting you some other time for something about Jammu and Kashmir, more specifically. Thank you very my, much. Sir. Thank my you. thanks also to Maruf. Thank, Thank you, you very much, ma'am. Thank you very much to everybody. And my apologies to General Tivedi because he was at full flow. And I was actually making notes from all the points that he said because for me, it's always a learning curve to listen to him. I'm sorry, sir. Hi, uh, I just have another prior appointment at 7 That's p.m. Right. I have to urgently be somewhere else for another engagement. So. Uh, unfortunately, I have to leave, but it's my loss. Thank you very much for giving me the chance to speak to you all. And I hope uh, some of you will find the chance and the opportunity to pick up copies of my book and read it. And General Sahib himself has a copy. Yeah, it's a great Thanks book. And and sure I'll be, you must read uh, Baruf's book. It's a very eye great eye-opener. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. You can continue, sir. Please, please. Sorry to interject in okay. between. Thank you. I'm just for going to take Thank you so much. Another three, four minutes. So I was just saying that the status of LEC has changed for for better or the worst, but the definitely Chinese have changed it, and I don't think we can retrieve any ground until we do another something like Kailash Ridge, and uh, that was a great opportunity. We made a great move. We could have got the Chinese actually, if not on the knees, but on the toes, but we came down. And that's again part of our uh, diplomatic, I would say, uh, if not weakness, but our diplomatic cold feet that we get. Otherwise, coming down from Kailash range and having been on that range, I think we could have got a very good bargain with the Chinese. And remember, the Western Theater Commander, the two of them have got moved, been moved out. And the guy who was uh, leading the negotiation, Major General Lu Lin, has been promoted. So that means, obviously, the Chinese negotiation team has done a great job. And Major General Lu Lin is now Lieutenant General. And he is uh, commanding the complete uh, Xinjiang military district. So the point number one is that we now to got to look at the LAC a little more differently because what our Chinese wanted in Ladakh, they are almost got it. They are on the 1959 line. Now, what are they doing in Arunachal Pradesh opposite Tibet? Chinese have a game plan. They want to make Tibet as a shield. And that's what Xi Jinping said in July last when he visited there. He spent three days in Tibet. And he said that Tibet will be a shield for the mainland. So they are making villages, about 240 in the front line and about 300 plus in the depth. So as that these villages are going to be the front line post, they are going to be dual use villages where the 
they have the pap which is part of pla which is the, like the border guards they only one uh, you know organization which looks after the complete borders that is the people armed police that is under the pla it's not under the home like ours so they are going to be the first line of defense secondly is they have built up the infrastructure that in a very short time they can bring colossal amount of force they have the two cores 77 and 76 cores they have a airborne division and they can build up about 6 to 8 divisions in matter of 2 to 3 days and uh, about 15 to 20 divisions in matter of week to 2 weeks so therefore it will be the show of force chinese do not want to fight let me tell you it doesn't suit them but the gray zone warfare is what is going to be the way they are going to dominate this lac through the uh, dual villages with pap uh, with the uh, pla in depth and wherever they get opportunity they will keep inching forward i had coined a terminology that is uh, you know uh, encroach gradually and uh, keep consolidating you know nibble and negotiate in chinese they call it san pan so that's what chinese are doing they they have nibbled complete south china sea they fired the last shots in 1975 after that they have fired live shots but they have gobbled the complete south china sea so therefore wherever they get the opportunity they will try to make gains but they will not like to get into fight even galwan they had they wouldn't even want to fight but this fight broke because our colonel suresh babu took them on and then the fight ensued and you imagine they are fight, going to fight this gray zone warfare they have known terms three warfare first is propaganda they lost more than 40 soldiers but they have only set four including one battalion commander that's how they do the propaganda and they keep showing lot of propaganda films second is psychological warfare that is what they that is very important for them because in china the media is totally controlled so whatever they feed the media the public takes it and they have a very sound system of propaganda and a very sound system what they call is the you know gray zone warfare and the third important point is the legal part what they do is what maruf said their concept is what i occupy is mine and that is what they never go back you imagine we signed five agreements two were signed when i was there from 1993 1996 2003 2007 2013 five agreements were signed and crux of the agreement is no force will be used to change the status of the lac patrolling will be done no permanent structure will be made chinese violated all the five now they will be going for new agreements where instead of patrolling points we will have the buffer zones so we are going to be losing the real estate again last two points please remember that as the chinese power grows their strategic space is growing they are now come out of the east and south china sea they are going into the western pacific and another 10 to 15 years they will be in indian ocean after gawada base is not only a tourist facility one of the chinese fleet will be very much in the gawada base and they are investing very heavily in all the small islands in indian ocean so the center of gravity will shift once tibet is sorted out indian ocean will be the next arena second is how do we take on chinese and that's where i'm going to end please remember chinese believe in power they believe in force non violence peace is not in the dictionary we only imagining but that is not their way of doing business chinese will deal with strong people as equals with weak they will just gobble them that is what the chinese you know foreign policy chinese strategy is secondly is china park collusion chinese have played very smart they kept us focused on pakistan we lost sight of china and today even pakistan chief yesterday he declared 
that we will defeat India in fifth generation of hybrid warfare. And we are already, we are not, we are not actually doing, uh, you know, great uh, credit to defeat Pakistan proxy war. They are sending these terrorists. We are killing them inside our own territory. And there's endless factories are there in, China, in Pakistan until we go and hit them inside. Until we make this very cost prohibitive, the Pakistan is not going to stop. So China and Pakistan are playing a great game. Pakistan is a front foot soldier. They are keep us, keeping us engaged in proxy war. We are losing people while Pakistan army is having a last laugh. Afghanistan is now back into the Pakistani pocket. Chinese are very deeply interested in that. And Chinese whole policy in South Asia, Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Maldives, Myanmar, they have got deep footprints into this. So my end line is to take on Chinese firstly, be strong. You cannot negotiate with Chinese from a position of weakness. We have to reduce the power differential. We have to stand our ground. What are we lost in you know, Ladakh? Well, there should be no further losses, but we have to be proactive. We have to do another Kailash rage. We have to make tell the Chinese that they will have to pay a price in case they don't stop the misadventure. Until Chinese get that message, Chinese are always going to be predominant. They are going to be aggressive. So our approach has to be twofold. Build up our capacity, build up our military strength, build up our economic strength, and go in for alliances. Today, in Quad, India is a weak chain. In Quad, America has defense agreement with Australia. America has defense agreement with Japan. We are the only guys who are shying away from such an agreement. And Chinese know that India doesn't have that guts to actually go into a military type of alliance. I think we need to knock the Chinese notion down. And uh, we should not shy away from getting into court as one of the defense partners, because otherwise China is not going to get the message. And my last closing line is, in future, for next 20, 30 years, China is going to be our problem. In conjunction with Pakistan, Chinese will ensure that we do not actually emerge from the South Asia cocoon. They will do every effort to ensure because for Chinese, weak India suits, passive Japan suits, strong India is not in the Chinese interest. And as far as Pakistan is concerned, dismembered India, this stabilized India is ideal for them. So unfortunately, two of our neighbors have total strategic convergence on their grand aims. And India has to have a very strong defense, economic, and foreign policy to negate the China threat. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. <clears throat> Uh, I was just looking at one of the quotes by Sun Tzu, where he said the opportunity of defeating the enemy is provided by the enemy himself. Absolutely. What an academic uh, discourse by Major General Dr. Gigi Devedi. It's my pleasure to share with all of you that uh, Major General Dr. Gigi Devedi is in fact a dual MPhil and uh, has also done his PhD in international relations from GNU Delhi. So what a combination of practice and academic. Uh, what a wonderful discourse by you, sir. We, it really helped us to understand the enemy. And unless we understand the enemy, we just can't fight. Thank you so much for presiding over this prestigious function. Before we move on to the vote of thanks, uh, may I request uh, Malti Gaikwadji uh, to please make her address, a brief address. Ma'am, over to you, please. Hello, good evening to everyone once again. <clears throat> I'd like to, on behalf of the family, I'd like to thank IIPA, uh, Mr. Bhan, Mr. Jandial, Mr. Vatali, Alka Sharma ji, Mr. Vikant Kothalia, and all others for very dedicatedly arranging this um, 
memorial lecture for my father, Mr. Sati Sani, year after year. And uh, we all three of us, brothers and uh, my brothers, my mother, me, all of us sitting far away in, in this pandemic, we cannot even be there personally. I have attended some of the talks myself. My brother has attended something and mummy used to make a point to be there. Anyway, it's nice of all of you to continue this uh, legacy in a certain way. I would also like to thank today's esteemed speakers, Mr. Maruf Raza and General Divedi Saab, both very learned speakers for joining this meeting and for their very pointed observations and insights on this pertinent subject. <clears throat> I'd like to thank each one of you who have spared your time to join this uh, memorial lecture today taking out your time uh, for this. Our family has been very emotional, has a very emotional connect with this. Uh, it uh, connects us to JNK in so many different ways, sitting far away. I'd like to thank uh, all of you on behalf of my mother and my brothers, Navneet and Mohit. And uh, I must have, may have missed out some names, but I can see a lot of familiar names on the screen. Uh, Mr. T.P. Singh, Mr. Um, um, Johar Saab, Rahul Sahai ji, then Rekha Chaudhary ji. I mean, you know, these names, all of them bring back memories of so many kinds. And last but not least, Jatin ji, who has always uh, he's been very uh, connected with my brother and kept us abreast with what is happening at IIPA in Jammu. Thank you all. On behalf of my mother, Prem ji and my brothers, Mohit and Navneet, we are all connected. Mummy is also listening to this today. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much. I now request Professor Alka Sharma, uh, the Honorary Secretary of the branch for the formal vote of address. Uh, uh, during the memorial lecture, we don't have the question answer session, nor do we have a discussion round. So please excuse us for that. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Anil. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my proud privilege to be given an opportunity to propose the formal word of thanks on the occasion of 12th Satpal Sani Memorial Lecture. This year, the topic was Indochina conflict, which has been at the center stage of the news media since last some time. The interest in topic has been very, very evident as the moment we introduced this topic on our website, a number of requests had come and so many people came forward on their own to be interested, to be registered for attending this particular session. Probably one of the very well attended sessions since some time. Uh, we had a very, very diverse audience ranging from students and scholars to army personnel, media members, academicians, administrators, everybody. Uh, we had two eminent speakers today to deliberate on the topic. We are grateful to you, Major General Gigi Duvedi, sir, for being with us here today and sharing with us the situation, what India should be doing and where we stand today vis-a-vis -vis the topic that is Indochina conflict. The kind of understanding I'm sure I can say on behalf of the audience is has been immense. It has been an absolute pleasure to hear you, sir. And we hope to hear more from you with your experiences sometime in near future. Thanks a lot for sparing your time and being with us. Dr. Ashok Bhan, retired IPS patron of IIPAJK Regional Branch. Thank you very much, sir, for being there all the time and every time your subtle push and pull strategy push by suggesting us some initiatives here and there and pulling us by giving a challenge we take that sir it is a great motivator for us and we always always are looking forward to your these subtle nudges here and there they train us they they help us in achieving our goals shri bhr sharma Retired IAS Chairman, IIPAJK Regional Branch. Thank you, sir, for supporting us unconditionally. Let me inform the audience that sir today is traveling, but he has been around to ensure that the event goes well. 
we thank you sir for being the rock behind us and supporting us in all our initiatives as you all are aware that this is a memorial lecture to commemorate the iipa association with shri satpal sani a key founding member who was a passionate war journalist his family including madam prem sani and their sons and daughter they have been actively following this particular event we thank you prem ma'am for being constantly with us during this particular program and celebrating sakti sir's memory with us we thank you all for being with us ma'am ma uh, uh, navneet ji mohit ji and of course gaikwad ma'am for being with us and sharing your just your presence makes us feel good that you are a part of iipa jk regional branch thank you very much for being with us i would like to place on record a sincere gratitude to colonel karan singh sir and vikrant kuthiala ji for being the people who organized this event because the speakers were through these two gentlemen of our branch that they gave us such wonderful speakers and we had a great time listening to you thank you karan singh sir thank you vikrant sir for helping us we are also thankful to professor rekha choudhary ma'am and shri kb jandyal sir for their support uh, the kind of interest this particular event has created a uh, lot of credit goes to uh, uh, rekha ma'am and jandyal sir of course thank you very much ma'am and sir for always standing with us and being a support today majority of the people who have been in this audience are from outside the iipa besides iipa i i i see a lot of faces here batali sir is there khuda sir is there uh, johor sir is there kasba sir is there um, you know uh, we are i'm seeing even uh, uh, too many uh, gentlemen who are there and uh, but of course they were they are our members and their presence is 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 a you know is very heartening but more than that this time we had so many people coming from outside who are not iipa members there were media people there were senior ias and ips officers retired army officials academicians not only from the universities of ut we had such a university people university of jammu people but besides that we had stu uh, students and faculty from guru nanak dev university amritsar university of delhi amity university lpu in uh, jalandhar affiliated colleges of university of jammu students scholars from all these institutions they have attended this program we thank all of you for sharing your time with us and supporting us in our endeavors to excel we look forward to such support in future also last but not the least i thank each and every one present here today for being with us and celebrating the life of sakti sir a loving and warm personality uh, we were talking about him before it has been a pleasure to know him personally and i would cherish his memories for long long time because the kind of warmth he would pass on to you as a person was something that we felt in this particular program so probably a good memory memorial lecture event was organized i thank each one of you we have jatin with us, with us. he has been a great support to us in uh, so thank you jatin thank you anil for coordinating the event you are the always the the, the technical guy how uh, holding the online events together so thank you one and all and uh, we look forward to sometime meeting you all in person very soon thank you very much thank you thank you